everyone, Jason Sherman here. In today's episode of Zero to CEO, I have with me the director of Business Sherpa Group, Dr. Sue Haywood. Thanks for joining the show. Thanks very much for having me. And we have a fun topic. We're going to talk about how to best engage with your startup remotely. We're in a post-pandemic world. Uh, people are working with either contractors, employees, team members, founders, and they have to do all of it through the wonderful world of Zoom and whatnot. So uh, what have you seen has been one of the challenges in startups that, uh, you know, they had to take this shift from in-person co-working spaces or offices, like really cool, like back and forth kind of collaboration versus now everything's online? Well, I think, and understandably so, people did this as a knee-jerk reaction to what was going on with the pandemic, right? Got to make our business survive. This is what we need to do. Successful companies have also made the mind shift to, we are now a virtual organization, and that requires a different set of approaches. Where companies have struggled is thinking that virtual means working from home. Right, that back to the 1990s idea of all of us are in an office, all of us are functioning paper based, and somebody has special permission to be at home for the day. That is not what we're talking about in 2022. Uh, this isn't special permission. This isn't trying to deviate from the norm. This actually is a really effective way to work together. Uh, we don't have to worry about geography. We don't have to worry about boundaries. We can find the best talent for our business anywhere in the world connect with them and really set it up that location is irrelevant. It's about if we have the right knowledge and the right people, how do we work together? And the, the virtual environment gives us the tools to do that. I agree 100%. Before the pandemic, for, for years and years, I worked in different locations with people. And I almost found like it was counterproductive. I might be one of the outliers thinking that, but when you're in person, you, you kind of putz around a lot. You take coffee breaks, you talk, you gossip, you, you walk around, you get distracted by the other people around. And I feel like ever, ever since everything went online, we just get stuff done. So Absolutely. And it can also make people a lot more connected if it's intentional. That's the one difference is, you know, you can accidentally bump into somebody in person and, oh, I was going to grab a coffee and saw so and so. So we started talking. That doesn't happen in the virtual world. So you have right. to be very intentional about your communications. But it also doesn't create a hierarchy. Um, right. Oh, those of us in head office versus you guys in a satellite office, or, oh, we're in this time zone, you're in that time zone. We can really set everything up to be cohesive. So what are some of the reasons you've found, uh, especially during the pandemic, why people you're working with or employees, they're just not working as hard as you are as the founder of the startup? You know, I've actually seen... Um, from a virtual perspective, those employees that are really supported in having a virtual work environment are working hard. Mm. Uh, they love the flexibility. They love how it helps them be all aspects of the human that they are. Of course, they're a great employee, but they're also maybe a spouse or a parent or a neighbor or whatever it is that they do in their life. And this allows them to do that instead of saying, you know, you have to work from nine to five. Uh, you have to be at a physical desk from this hour to this hour. It's okay if you know you have to take a 20 minute break to go drive you know someone to school, drive a neighbor to the grocery store. That's okay. Right. That actually makes them more productive. Right, taking breaks and and the <laughs> me the mental aspect because I mean, we've been seeing mental health problems surfacing like crazy and people Absolutely. getting people getting burned out. Right then we had the. The um, the quiet resi resignation, then it was uh, quiet quitting or whatnot, and all these terms popping up, which really just means people are working less because they're tired of being treated like crap, and maybe they're not shown that their work makes a difference. So, how? What have you? You know, what, what's the what's going on? Like how, with employees or or people? Like what is happening really? Because it's a lot of stuff going on, right? Well, I think some of the mistakes have been a lot of leaders, you know, executives have really managed the things that don't matter, mm. right? You didn't hire somebody to, you know, be at a desk at eight o'clock. That's not what's important about their job. So really focus on those outputs of what is it you want your employees to be doing. And as long as your employees are performing those outputs, why does it matter how or when it's being done? Or where? Obviously with <laughs> deadlines, right, or where? And so I think that's where 
virtual work can really help from a mental health perspective. Yes, we have to focus on that human aspect to make sure there's still connectivity and people don't feel alone and isolated. Right. But as long as that's managed, you know, it allows people to prioritize whatever part of their life has to be prioritized at that moment versus I can't think about my life until I'm done work. I, I'm really stressed about, you know, that I have to go do something, but I can't do it until I'm done work. You know, if you can separate it and say, okay, the best thing for me to be doing at this time is X and the best time for me to be doing work is this time, it actually helps people with the balance. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, in, when you were just answering that, that uh, people, uh, you need to show them that they're not alone, right? right? And like, what are some of the tips or tactics that you can use to do that, especially in this in this virtual environment? I mean, I'm working with, you know, 10, 15 people in a startup and it's all Slack messages and the occasional yeah. huddle or video call or phone call. But most of it is just, you know, words on a screen. And, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, camaraderie and like that in-person socialization. Uh, so what are some of the ways of combating that? Yeah, and I think a lot of those tools can work, but again, it has to be intentional. So why not have a Slack channel that is just a chit chat, right? Find your other channels are for business. Have one dedicated to anything but business. Um, same thing, book a meeting to have a coffee chat. Catch up, ask everyone what they're doing. No agenda, no work talk. Uh, but almost a four, and I don't mean forced socialization where people have to spend hours together, but a quick 20 minute coffee at a time that's convenient for everybody. How was your weekend? How's your family? Uh, are you going on vacation this year? Things like that can really make us remind us that we're valued as people, not just as workers. Yeah. One of the things that, that I've been doing in my current startup is, uh, for example, this Saturday, we're hosting an event, right? We're doing like a kind of like a launch party, birthday party mix where we're just doing games, food having a good time and anybody who can come is coming anybody who doesn't drive we're going to pay for ubers just like everybody come in person to hang out and not work right so so like i feel like that's something you know that used to be like what taco tuesdays and like happy hours people used to do but now the pandemic and with like the economy and like prices going up and people are kind of more frugal and maybe not going out as much so maybe they can just do um, some online games or trivia nights or something you know Absolutely. Even, you know, like you said, online games, trivia, watch a movie as a team, something yeah. like that. Um, but I love this idea of, yes, in-person events can be really, really effective, but they don't have to be every week. Right. We're doing it once every couple of months or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that makes it a lot less stressful. Um, but still, it reminds people that they're important. Go back to also some of the old fashioned uh, things that we don't think about anymore. What about sending uh, your, your staff a card? Mm hmm. When was the last time you got a card in the mail? Something like that can really remind them of, you know what, I am valued. It's not a lot of, not a high cost item, but it's a high touch item. Yeah, I remember, uh, I don't know if you remember the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix and he he was writing the cards as a job. <laughs> that, was actually, <laughs> that, was, that was really cool. Like I, that's the future. The future is writing hand it's cards. It's going back, right? Yeah, it's, it's something yeah. that stands out and it's different. I like and it. And it takes effort. So we saw this paradigm shift in the workforce, right? Uh, traditional incentives and rewards are not enough for many employees today to stick to a company. Right. So what is now the new thing that's working to attract and retain top talent during the great resignation and now this new quiet quitting? Like, how do you keep people? How do you get them in there? How do you motivate them? So I think it actually, we need to step back a moment and think about the three big categories that go into total rewards. So obviously one is compensation and I'll throw benefits in there, you know, either sure. retirement, all of that, the money stuff. Right. But there's two others that are really important. One is flexibility, something that virtual word offers a lot of. The other is autonomy of how much control do I have over what I do, how I perform my job, how I use my skills. Uh, how how creative can I be? How can I do, you know, bring what makes me amazing to the workplace? And so those are sort of the three levers that employers have to pull. And the more you pull back on flexibility and the more you pull back on autonomy, the more you've got to give on compensation. And I'm not saying sense. you can underpay people, but you could really develop a much more uh, meaningful package that's probably also more affordable. If you can give in the areas of flexibility and autonomy, people want to know that they're experts. Automation is incredibly important in today's day and age. In what way? Auto 
Well, you know, it's about automating the stuff that people don't want to do. Oh, you mean like using artificial intelligence, machine learning, or yeah, just like use software related? Some of the softwares we can use, you know, things like processing an invoice. Why okay. can't that be automated? I don't need a human to do that. That doesn't make a, a human satisfied they've been able to do that. So are you or saying I like removing a lot of the tedious? Are you saying like removing yeah. a lot of the tedious, uh, you know, administrative tasks or duties oh. from people's workloads and then saying, here, do the creative fun stuff instead? Exactly. Oh, interesting. I actually need a human expert to to make those changes, to to have that vision, to plan out the future, to be responsive to environmental changes. So, the, so you're you're forward thinking now into what one of my areas that I love is artificial intelligence and oh. like the future of technology and like where we're headed. Uh, do you think that that's really where things are going to end up for the new generation of workers that will start to come out of this pandemic eventually? Is I do. I mean, you know, the new generation of workers, let's say you know, people 18 years of age and younger are so tech savvy. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to have any desire to do those, you know, low level tasks that a lot of us have done because there was no alternative. Right. And how are we going to engage them? And also we're in a war for talent. There's a lot more opportunity than there are, you know, great talent uh, out there. And as the as the market shifts, we need to be able to to grab onto that talent and keep them interested as, as people retire, as some of that other expertise leaves. Uh, and automation is a great way to do that. I agree 100 percent. Something that people ask me actually pretty often, and I'm still mulling over the answer <laughs> is, uh, you know, when you have, you know, say five to 10 people in marketing and then you have like five developers and then you might have a business person here or there, content people, things like that. How do you give them or t tell them what your vision is, the mission of the company and how, how you kind of make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of the culture of the company? How do you get them to buy into that? Because it's not the easiest thing to say, hey, we're a cool company, we're fun, we'll let you give us your ideas, we want you to be creative, we want to hear what you have to say, but like, how do you get them to actually engage with that? You're right, it is really challenging. And I think, so twofold. One, the company really has to put the effort into clearly communicating what that vision is. And I don't mean the 14 sentence uh, vision statement that we've all seen at uh, certain organizations. That doesn't mean anything to people. Like put it into a few words. You're not trying to get a Pulitzer Prize. You are trying to clearly communicate something in the fewest possible words so everybody can understand and embrace it. And then really demonstrate that everything we do links back to maybe those two or three bullets. Uh, we're going to do this. This links back because it connects to point number one. This part connects to point number two. And really demonstrate that connection and really through repetition, get other people to sort of start to mimic and then repeat and embrace it as well. That's a great way to look at it. So like find, I guess, your core value proposition, you would say, right? The, the things that make your company stand out from the others, take those three words and then tie into the things that you're tasking them with. That's great. So say you're a leader, right? You're in charge of a startup and mm -hmm. everybody has to listen to you for, for all intents and purposes. <laughs> How do you effectively drive change in the organization? Like if you start to see things kind of linger in the wrong direction or things are not going the way you planned, how do you effectively manage and make them go down the right path? Well, I think the one step that many of us overlook is we get so focused on the correction itself is we forget to explain the why. Mm. And people are a lot easier to lead and convince to change if you can really connect that why for them. Uh, right now, we're doing this and we're getting this result. This is not the result we want. We want to change to this because it you know, better aligns with the result we're trying to get. And if we do this, we will see this change and really help them understand the why you're asking them to do it. And that in, in and of itself respects them as people. You know, you're a thinking, sentient being, and I'm going to explain to you the why versus just giving you direction. Wow. These are amazing tips that I hope everybody who's <laughs> listening or watching has learned a ton because I know I sure have. And from the look of your uh, your accolades, PhDs, armed forces, adjunct professors, officers, all sorts of amazing uh, things that you've done. So uh, I applaud you for your efforts and for paying it forward by telling my listeners how to help engage with their startups better. 
Oh, it's been my pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation, Jason. It's been wonderful chatting. No problem. And uh, where can people find out more about what you do and what you offer in terms of services? Yeah, our either our website or our LinkedIn. We're under Business Sherpa Group, and we are located in Canada, but would welcome uh, contacts from anywhere around the world. The whole episode is about being remote. so <laughs> Exactly. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks again, and we'll see everybody in the next episode. 